Okay. Hello, my name's Roy. I'm a targeted individual. And today I've got a lovely lady with me. Her name's Lauren, and she's from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Thanks for joining us, Lauren. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much, Roy, for having me again. Absolute pleasure. Lovely to see you. Likewise. So what's your story, Lauren? Well, I am a Havana Syndrome victim and a targeted individual. And I didn't know that until one day when I was um, staying with my ex-boyfriend. He and I both were sitting on the couch just watching TV like we would normally do. And all of this, all of a sudden, I get an impact to my head um, out of nowhere. I have never experienced anything so painful and just, it just blew my mind. And it rocked when the, when that pain hit me, it rocked my brain inside of my skull. Very shortly after that, I looked at my ex-boyfriend and asked him, did he feel the same pain? And he looked back at me and said, no, but your nose is bleeding. And it was in fact bleeding. So, you know, I didn't know anything about frequencies. I had no clue about targeted individuals, nothing about Havana syndrome victims, any of that. All I knew is that was the start of bad things to come. Um, from that day, and that would have been, I think, 2019, 2020 is when it all started. But hindsight is 2020. So when I look back and I think about all the things that were going on in my life, it was not making any sense to me. I come to realize it came full circle. And that's when I knew that something was not right about my life that had changed drastically. Um, I was getting on the phone. The phone calls were dropping. My mom moved in. She would say the same thing was happening to her. Uh, I remember several years back when I was still here in my house before I went to stay with my, my ex. I started missing a lot of mail. Um, and so it was making me late with the credit cards because I wasn't getting my credit cards in the mail on time. So that would give me late charges. So I started questioning, well, I'm calling the company, but they're saying, no, we're sending your mail on time. So the next thing that I did from that was go uh, start calling post office. And they kind of treated me like it was no big deal. Um, I pursued it. I kept calling and kept calling. Week after week, still wasn't getting any kind of resolve. So I started filing a complaint with the postmaster. And when I did that, then, you know, it was still like downplayed, but, you know, it, it, it didn't get any better. So I said, well, let me just call the main office. And that's what I did. And I filed a big complaint with the main office, the big postal office. Um, and one day out of the blue, I see this post truck come down my street. And it's around 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And no mail is supposed to be running at that hour. And up comes the mailman with this pretty much shoebox full of mail. I mean, I had stacks and stacks of mail dated from way back. And I was shocked. So that was just one of many things to come. Now, back to um, the impact to my head. So when I got that... I got up and I went in the bathroom and normally I, it, during the daytime, I don't turn the lights on. So, um, but something said, turn the light on. So when I turned the light on, both of my eyes were dark and I just couldn't figure out what that impact was. Immediately after that, I started doing my own research and I thought, well, maybe this could be coming from the po postal I mean, not posted, but the lights that are posted on the street lights. I thought maybe it could have been coming from that. It didn't make sense then that it was coming from there at all. Then I said, well, maybe the wires from the underground, it's, it's causing this. 
And I started doing research to see if any type of thing had happened before with anybody else. That didn't make sense. The next thing I thought, well, maybe it's coming from the new meters because they were, the Duke Energy here was starting to put new meters in people's homes to upgrade to the 5G. So that made some sense to me, but not so much. Um, and I kind of stuck with the 5G, but it still was not registering with me. So I started looking at maybe what foods I was eating. Uh, wasn't really taking any medication, so it wasn't anything that could have been going in that direction. Um, and then I was talking to my sister and a best friend of mine, and they were saying, well, maybe you have some kind of uh, medical condition. And I'm thinking, no. So that didn't make sense. But anyway, I went on the website and just out of the blue, I see this case, this one case where this person is talking about um, how they're being targeted. And the more I read into the information about that person, I found out that they had filed a suit, a lawsuit. And um, it was saying everything that was going on within that lawsuit that was going on with me. But I still, it wasn't registering why that was happening to him or him or her, I can't even remember. Um, but the same thing was happening to me. So across the board, I'm looking at everything. And all of a sudden I came across Pax and Pax brought me to uh, Lorraine, who is a therapist. So I called her out of the blue and she was like, how do you get my number, blah, blah, blah. And then she and I started talking a little bit further. And she is the one that kind of gave me a little more, more insight. When Derek finally called me back, because I had reached out to him, Millicent Black, these are people I never knew. But I just saw where Pax was doing like the same type of, um, you know, studies and research uh, as to what I had found with the person of the lawsuit. And so when he finally called me back, he was telling me, yes, these things are happening to him and hundreds of thousands of other people. And then I reached out to Millicent, who was also on the board, and she said that she was a board member and it was happening to her. So it was just like a domino effect after that. And it, it was like from one thing after another, I was making connection with people who were also being targeted. So that's how it all started for me. And <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I do have this little sinus thing going on. Let me get a drink. <coughs> I was told that I should have waited until I got my voice back. No, you sound fabulous. But anyway, uh, so. Millicent Black, Dr. Black, started teaching me a lot about, um, you know, some of the things that was going on with her. And then she began sending me information and stuff. And I just could not really psychological, re psychologically relate. But then again, I could because we were talking the same language. And I come to know that she went and had a lot of medical studies done, sleep studies, they have found chips in her and things like that. And then I just started wondering, I wonder if I have any chips in me. And um, there was a period, of course, like I said, I was staying with my ex that out in extend, an extended period that I was staying out of my home because I had some old issues and I almost literally died in this house. So when I came back to my house, um, it looked like there was a lot of different things that was going on that didn't look familiar. So for instance, it looked like some of my doors had been reinstalled. Some of my windows had been reinstalled where my locks connect to the other side of the door. Somebody chiseled all of my doors out and I have four entry doors. So you know, it was easy access for them to just come into my house. Well, I really didn't know that at the time until after some time that I had moved back home. And that's when I started calling the police and saying, look, you know, there's various things that's going on. Let me just go back for a second. I would come home and check on my house and I would see where someone had 
urinated on my front porch. Um, then my, my mailbox got kicked down. And then my fence got kicked down. Uh, I have various, uh, you know, flower pots in my yard. They were all kicked over and cracked. Um, on my embankment, I have like the professional black plastic to cover for the weeds and all of that. That was constantly being cut off. And I mean, from one end of my yard to the, to the other. Um, it was various things that were happening before I actually moved back home that I really was not grasping. One day, I had received a call from the police department that my house had been broken to. And if it had not been for a neighbor that stayed across the street from me at the time, telling the police that she had seen these kids throw a boulder inside of my window. Well, that cost almost $6,000 worth of damage. Um, I would have never known who had broken into my home. It was so many things going on, just back to back. I had the police at my house constantly, and I do now. So let me just bring you up to speed on what's going on now. As recent as New Year's 2023, um, I was invited to go to my aunt's and eat dinner with her. And But before I left my house, I seen these prints these feet prints inside of my my house. Um, I had had a guest over that night because he took me out for my birthday. And so when we came in, he just stayed on over. So when I woke up that morning, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't move because I felt like I had been drugged. And I really believe that the drink that was bought for me for my birthday had some kind of chemical in it. Well, I asked him to help me get up. He couldn't get me up out of the bed. I laid back down. Finally, he told me he was going to leave. He left. And I finally got myself together after some more rest, I guess. Tried to get up and put my phone on charge and realized my charger was missing. I decided that I would get my clothes on, go around to his house and borrow his charger. Well, when I entered to my kitchen, I see these feet prints. They're not my feet prints. And so I'm looking across my floor. And the reason why I can discover these, these prints are very large is because I had put baking soda down throughout my floor. And that was an indication for me. If anybody came in my house while asleep or after I left my residence, then I would be able to see the feet prints. Lo and behold, I wasn't looking for these prints but I saw them so when I saw the prints I went on around his house and told him that my charger was missing I asked him did he go in the kitchen at any time from the time we got back from going out that evening to the next morning at first he said no and then he said yeah I went in there to get something to eat I said well did you go in there barefooted he said no I said well there's several prints throughout my kitchen that um, I don't know how they get got there. And so now back to the part where I was on my way to my aunt's house. So I see this police car over in this school parking lot and I passed him and I said, no, I'm not going to pass him. I'm going to go back and report this incident. So I went back to him and said, uh, exactly what I had discovered and I asked him if he was on the call and he said at the time he was I said but I would like for you to come back to my house so that you can see these prints and so he said well you'll need to call downtown blah 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 and see if you can get another officer I said but I would rather for you do it and so he said well let me call in and let them know so um, he followed me to my house we came on in the house and yes the, the prints were still there, obviously. Um, and so I started to take my shoes off because I wanted him to look and see that the size feet that were on the floor were not the same same size as my feet. So he, when I was taking off my shoes, he was like, oh, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. Well, when I think about that, I'm wondering, why did he stop me? You know, why didn't he just let me go ahead and get a comparison of the, the feet size so he could see 
yeah, these are not your feet. These are human humongous feet. And actually, they looked like there was another set of prints that looked like baby feet. I mean, not toddler feet, but, you know, um, somebody that may have been maybe 13, 12 years old. Um, and on the other side of my sink, there was even larger feet. And I'm thinking, well, how many people came in my house? Because somebody came in my house that night. Um, since then, the other incident that happened last week, let me tell you about that. So I had just ordered some alarms to go up, up under my door. So if anybody pushes the door open slightly, the alarm will go off. So I had one at my back door and I put the other one inside of my window that's in my living room. Um, the same person that I told you I went out with, I went to stay with him. I'd been with him up until last night. So for about seven days, I've been away from my house up until last night. Um, but when I came home to check on my house one day, I heard this noise. I walk in my living room and there I find uh, the alarm and I'm going to show you what it looks like. This is the one that I keep at my door, but the other one I had at my window. The alarm had somehow or another got put on my couch. Okay. No, I didn't put it there. The perpetrators that are constantly coming in my house every time I leave and they can't wait till I go down my driveway before they intrude in my house. They put that alarm on my couch and see what is happening with everything that's happening here in my house. They're letting me know that they have been in my house. They have no reason to try to hide the fact that they've been in my house. This is the alarm. So this goes up under your door. And if you slightly push the door, the alarm will go off. So this is what I had enlarged in, in my dining, I mean, in my living room window. And the alarm was still going off, of course, but it wasn't where I put it. It was on the couch. Now, another incident just happened just two days ago when I came to check on my house. So there was a picture that I had on the floor and it was stationed up against the wall. Well, when I came in and started walking toward my bedroom, that picture, which I'm going to show you, was standing out from the wall, okay? It should not have been standing out from the wall because that is not where I put it. So right here is the picture, and this is how it was pulled out. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna come from behind so you can see. So this is the way the picture was stationed. You oh, see it? Yeah. Instead of the picture being right there where I put it, which was up against the wall, they had it standing out like that. So these are the things that um, the perpetrators are doing to let me know when they come in my house that they have been here and they don't care how many times I call the police. That doesn't bother them at all. What they're trying to do is probably set a case to say, well, she's just somebody that's crazy. She wants to call the police. She's crying wolf, wolf and doing all. No, I don't have time for all of that. When you come in my house, you're violating me. You have no right to be in here. I have uh, no trespassing signs throughout my home on the outside. So when you come in and you're not invited in, you have violated me. These are just one of many incidents, Roy. I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to, to continue on. But so why I don't will you say, get yourself a webcam? Well, I believe that, um, I, I'm just thinking that maybe the drones and I have them over my house nightly, they follow me throughout the town. And when I go to another state, they follow me. I just believe that they can hit these alarm systems and knock out, because a lot of times I've come home and my power was out. And how I know that is because the alarm is making a noise and then my uh, stove light is blinking. I just believe they can knock out the power anytime that they want to from the drones and still come in. You know, it's no big deal. 
People think that they have security with these ADT and alarm system. They don't. There is no such thing as a secure system when it comes to a criminal such as the FBI, the CIA. When they want to come in your home, they can come in. Even like I said, I looked throughout my house and saw where it looked like my doors had be re been reinstalled and some of my windows. So I believe that they can even take your windows out completely while they knock you out from the drones or whatever poison that they give you that you may drink or eat and reinstall those things and you don't know anything by the time you wake up you don't know anything you know what i'm saying yeah well i've so... got three cameras <coughs> yeah i've got three cameras so when i go out i activate the cameras and uh, well, two of them, two of them are different so that if well, one got hacked i could rely on the other ones they're different models I see, I see. So let me tell you about the cameras. So I had ADT with AT&T, which is a phone company. Um, they had my security system. They had my cable system. They had my cell phone system all locked in one. Um, during the time that I'm telling you that I would have all of these incidents happen, like urination on my porch, kicking over my mailbox, doing all of those things. When I would call the police out to my house and it was time for me to show the footage to the officer, yeah. the footage was gone. Right. Every single time the footage was gone. Okay. So they can wipe the footage away from, you know, they can wipe the footage away. Yeah. Well, mine have got no SD cards in them. So mine would uh, go straight to the SD card. And if you pay a little bit extra, it uploads it to the cloud as well. You know, yeah. so. Well, yeah. then there's the other thing. So my phone is hacked. Um, it's doing all types of weird things right now. I mean, but that's kind of where it started for me. Because like I say, when I would be on the phone and I would be talking on business calls and all of a sudden out of the blue, the phone would just disconnect. Yeah. That has happened so many times I can't even count. Yeah. I would call the other party back and say what happened. And they would say, I don't know. The phone just dropped. Well, that might be okay for one or two times. But when I tell you every time I got on a business call to make any kind of uh, business transaction or have a conversation about my business, the phone would just drop. So that's where it started. And I remember that went back as far as 2015 when I first got my cell phone. And um, I mean, it was happening like back to back to back. Right. And I just- So thought, this started for you in 2019? Well, being hit with the frequencies, but right. let, me say, let me say it to you this way. I was experiencing some pain um, around the rectum area and I just thought maybe I was having some type of spasm um, and that was before 2019 so those things were occurring not often but often enough for me to start paying attention now when I started talking to different folks they were telling me that they were being sodomized and I'm thinking Okay, well, somebody's done came in and raped you. Well, no, that's not what they meant. Mm -hmm. They meant being raped by weaponry. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just didn't figure that could happen. So when I think about what was going on with me then, and a number of occasions it did happen, uh, not back to back, but, you know, sometime here and sometime there. And, and I thought, okay, well, if they're telling me they're being raped by weaponry, then I have to believe that because I'm getting hit with something I can't see. They're getting raped by something that they can't see. Am I being raped as well? I absolutely am. I am being raped with this weaponry. And 
the best way I can figure is that they have got chips <coughs> in those areas where they can target you the most. And I figure I must have chips there. I know I have them throughout my body. Um, so we'll go into that portion. I got shot in 2021. I have five bullets in one leg, 15 holes between two legs. Okay. Um, I went into the hospital and I had questioned the doctor about removing the bullets. So initially they told me that they were going to. It was a big thing, I tell you. At the end of the day, they were telling me that we're going to get you prepared to move, remove these bullets. They never did. What they were doing was beginning to starve me. So, you know, they don't want you to eat anything prior to you doing surgery. Okay. So that's what their excuse was to keep me from eating. And I can't tell you how much weight I lost from just them telling me every other day, we're going to prepare you for surgery. They were keeping me from eating. They were not giving me water, anything. So there were so many incidents that was happening in North Carolina Baptist Hospital that I can't begin to tell you, but I will tell you this. When I said that I want to get these bullets out of me and they told me that they were going to, they changed their mind. And um, I figured that they didn't want to take the bullets out for evidence because if you pull a bullet out, quite naturally, you can match it with a gun, right? Well, what they did do... <laughs> And I'm going to try to make the long story short about this particular hospital. They came in my room one day and told me I had 10 minutes to get out of their hospital. I had been shot five bullets in my leg. And I look around and it's about 20 people in my room. And one of the staff member is members is demanding that I get out of the hospital and I had only 10 minutes to do so and then I look around and security had walked in and he said uh you're gonna have to leave well I could not even hardly move the whole time I was in the hospital I had to have assistance because I could not urinate on my own I mean it it was just a lot of things going on behind this particular hospital but they didn't remove the bullets. When I started making too much noise about them removing them, they removed me from the hospital. And what they did was they gave me those 10 minutes to get dressed, put me in a wheelchair. A staff of about 20 people followed me to the elevator. Some of those got on the elevator. I was threatened by security. I was taken down to the bottom level. I was pushed out of the hospital and left on the sidewalk. And this was in the cold of winter. This was very cold, okay? So out of the blue, the person that happened to be with me on the night that I got shot, who did not get shot at all, um, just out of the blue appeared. And I asked him, I said, you know, I hadn't talked to him since the shooting. I said, where have you been? And he was like, well, I've been doing this, that, and the other. And it seemed like he had a very aggressive attitude while he was speaking to me. And I'm like, what is going on with you? Why are you talking to me like that? And so, um, you know, he just got more aggressive the more we talked. Well, now I'm just sitting there in the wheelchair trying to figure out where am I going from here? Because I'm still sitting outside of the hospital in a wheelchair with no warm clothing, no medication, no food, no means of calling anybody. I'm just sitting there. So a, a friend of mine called. She said, Lauren, I want you to video where you are right now. And that's what I started to do. Very shortly after I did the video, there was a security guard that came over to me and said, you are going to have to get off of this property. 
And I said, go where? Go how? He said, and he pointed, you're going to have to go up the street and get off of this property. And um, this guy that was with me pushed me up there. And while he was pushing me, he was very aggressive in doing so. So I almost several times fell out of the wheelchair. But I told him, you know what? That's okay. Just leave me. I don't need for you to be treating me like this. So, <coughs> excuse me, I was left on the corner of Hawthorne Avenue here in Winston-Salem and Baptist Medical Hospital. I sat on that corner for six straight hours in a wheelchair. Out of the hospital, I go from the hospital to the curve. You understand what I'm saying, Roy? Yeah. I wheelchair for six straight hours with the open wound, five bullets, 15 holes between two legs from the five bullets, sitting on a curve at Baptist Hospital. No medicine again. No means of transportation. No warm clothing. Nothing. So um, I had got in touch with uh, a Facebook friend and I told her that these things were going on. She said, well, Lauren, I'm going to call security and see if I can't get some help. So I just told her, I said, well, whatever you need to do. So security did not come for a long time, but what I decided to do was call the EMS myself. And um, there were two women that finally came out and um, they asked me if I needed to be transferred. I said, yes. They said, what hospital do you want to go to? And I told them for Psych Memorial. They said, well, because you are on Baptist Medical private property we cannot transport transport you and i said what they said you cannot be transported from us because you're on another hospital's property and i thought i've never heard of anything like that in my life so after going back and forth with them telling them everything what i just told them, no medication no warm clothing, no food. They left me. They left me to sit in that chair and that's what equated to six hours. Well, the person that I spoke with called security. Security came finally after several hours and said, do you need some assistance? And I said, yes. He said, well, I'm going to call EMS. I said, I've already done that. I, and he said, well, what happened? I said, they left me here. They told me that they couldn't transport me because I was on private property. And I said, well, I will catch you. What I told them, the EMS, I said, I will catch a cab, go down the street. I said, can you pick me up from there? And they were like, well, as long as you're not on Baptist, Baptist. Well, all of that was Baptist property. So no, they would not even let me catch a cab to go another end of the, the street to be picked up down the street. So anyway, this security said, well, I'm going to call them back anyway. I said, well, you can call them if you want to. They've already told me that they're not going to transport me. And I'm very upset because I've never been told by anybody that I can't get transportation from EMS, emergency services, to go to another hospital. And so he called them after a short while they came and he told them, he said, you were not supposed to leave her here. He said, whether you own Baptist property or not, you should not have left her there here. He said, you have you should have transported her from Baptist to Psych Memorial. And so they're now having a discussion with him on the side. And so now they're coming to me. Done fell, one of them fell down on their knees, Roy, and was apologizing so much, I didn't think she was ever going to stop. She was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Both of them actually did apologize. But she apologized the one that kneeled down in front of me. And she was like, I'm so sorry. We should have listened to you. We should have transported you over to Versailles at your request. I said, you know what? I tried to tell you exactly my story. I said, but you didn't want to listen. And because of that, 
you said that because I was on this property, I was not going to be transported and you did not transport. I said, I told you I have been sitting here for several hours, no food, no water, no medicine, no nothing. And you see that I'm sitting here with no clothing and you left me here. They apologized from one end to no end. And so uh, the security guard said, Lauren, just let them take you to Forsyth. And now I'm upset and I'm crying and I'm saying, I don't even care, just whatever. At that point, I had ran out because I didn't have any more life in me. And so I get over to Forsyth and <laughs> lo and behold, they said, where did she come from? And they told them, they said, well, she came from a trauma hospital. We can't do anything from her for her. Take her back to Forsyth, take her back to Baptist. And I said, take me where? I said, I'm not going back to that hospital. Well, it was hours upon hours upon hours before I even got seen at Forsyth Memorial. I go in that hospital and it was a domino effect. I got some kind of shot that blew my arm out up so big that it was a golf ball size because I had had an infection and I had been telling them it's wrong with my leg. Well, the one thing that was wrong with it, when I went to Baptist, they put the galls in my leg. It had got impacted, so I had to have it surgically removed. But they started treating my leg and I started noticing how it was turning green. And by me having some background in medicine, it appeared to be infection to me. And so I'm telling this PA over and over and over, something is wrong with my leg. Well, I demanded on this particular day, after almost of a month of telling her about my leg, and I felt that there was an infection. So she still ignored me. It just so happened that I had seen a friend that is a almost a medical doctor um that I've known for about 35 years and he walked in my room one day and he was like Lauren what are you doing in here and I said you know I got shot I said I want you to take a look at my leg and immediately he did that I said it's infected and he said I see the area that you're speaking of he immediately told the nurse to go get a swab well she came back with the swab. He swabbed my leg. He did several tests and they sent it off for testing. Do you know when the test came back? I tested positive for uh, endococcus and strep, um, streptococcus. Both of those could have um, could have taken me out. Those are very deadly things to be diagnosed with, you know, um, not streptococcus, but endococcus. And um, it was another one that's highly contagious and it can also take you out of this world. So the first day I got the test back, she told me what the one diagnosis was. The next day came, the same PA came back in my room. She said, you have been tested for another positive uh, disease. So what they were waiting to do, I'm pretty sure, was to either get my leg cut off from the disease, diseases that were in my leg. But um, had it not been for my friend coming in and doing the testing that he did, perhaps that would have happened. Or I would have died first, one of the two. But... Um, from there, I was put in a mental institution, um, and it's a long, long story with that, but I have been put in, I have been institutionalized twice. Uh, the first time was when I first got hit in my head, and I go to the hospital, try and explain to the doctor what had happened, and they decided that they would institu institutionalize me. And um, then the second time I got institutionalized when I went to physical therapy from the hospital, uh, I was threatened that if I didn't get on the, the gurney and let them take me over to the hospital to do some mental testing 
that I was going to be shot up with these drugs and they wouldn't make me go. And um, it, it's just it was it's just been a number of things that has been going on. And just to let you know, as you probably already do, the stigma that goes along with this program is to make you appear that you do have some mental in, you know, issues. But we know that that's not the truth. You know, uh, it is documented now. So when I call the police, the first thing they see is that, well, she's been institutionalized twice. So when I start making complaints about the things that's been going on around my house, they're thinking, well, you know, she's crazy. So we were just going to act like we care about her and make her a report. And, but they don't, you know, they're all in cahoots with what's going on with us. And that's just one of many things. But the stigma that goes along with this program is to make you appear crazy. And so <laughs> that's what is going on with me. And it's, it's going to be every time I open my door and go out and go down my driveway, somebody's going to be inside my home because that happens every time I leave. And that's just about every day. Every day I come back and find something out of place. And they do that to let you know, yes, we indeed have been in your house and we want you to know that, you know, um, friends that I have known for 30, 40 years have just gone away, you know? <laughs> and then I try to talk to them about the incidents that's going on with me. And they just look at me like I'm strange. And I know that they know because they all get quiet. You know, that's the one way you can always tell when they really know what's going on with you. They're not gonna elaborate too much, okay? They're not gonna say too much about what you're commenting on because they're told not to. And I'm telling you, I have had friends after friends after friends just disappear. They just go away. And I haven't seen some of them for quite some time, especially since I've been targeted. I haven't seen some of them since 2019, 2020. Um, and my family, now my mother was a target. She's dead. My dad was a target. He's dead. My grandmother was a target. She's dead. And I don't need anybody to tell me that this was not a part of the system. This program, as we call it, program. Um, my mother sp specifically was trying to tell me some incidents alike. The things that were going on with me were going on with her. and. Um, she too would also have to call the police out every week or every two weeks, once a month, whatever, because they were doing things in her apartment. And um, I'm going to give you one crazy incident that happened to my mom. She stayed in this apartment complex and there was a lady that's connected to her apartment behind her. And my mother was up one day and she had walked into her bathroom and she hears this loud crash. And she goes into her kitchen. There she finds a man that came over from the back apart apartment through the rafters, fell down through the roof onto her floor. These are the things that they were doing to mess with my mother. They were coming in from one apartment to the other of her apartment and doing different things inside of her apartment. And she kept wondering, how are they getting in here? Well, when he fell down from her ceiling and hit the floor, we knew the answer then. He was traveling from one apartment coming to her apartment and doing different things and so she was trying to tell me Lauren somebody has been coming in and coming in and doing different things and at the time I didn't see it obviously but when that guy fell in through her roof that was it we figured he was part of the program and harassing her stalking her and doing all of that so anyway, he got up off the floor. She said, what in the hell are you doing in my apartment? He said, I came over to visit somebody. She said he got up 
walked out through the front door and left and went right back to his mother's house, which was behind the apartment in which my, my, uh, my mother lived. So these are things that she was trying to tell me, but because and she was a mental health nurse, so she didn't want to say too much because she knew people would think she was crazy, but she knew what she was talking about. Um, she was saying just different things was happening to her. And I really didn't start really recognizing and seeing the things that she was trying to explain to me until that incident happened. And then I believed everything that she was saying. Um, but, you know, people start talking to you about different things like this. And they wonder if you ever are going to believe them because none of it makes sense. Right. Yeah, exactly. So Nora, why did you get shot? And did they catch the people? Oh, okay. So <laughs> huh. this car had been following me for about a week and a half on and off. Um, and I said, it's strange because every time I would see this same car, they would either be on the side of me passing in the other direction or they would be coming behind me. So quite naturally, I could not get the tags because I was going to get the license tags and turn it into the police. Because I became very curious as to why this car was following me. Um, the particular guy that I'm telling you about that pushed me out to the street at the hospital is the same guy that was in the car with me and got sh when I got shot. So I had picked him up around three o'clock one morning and we used to sleep in my car because again, I had mold in my house and I didn't want to stay in here because it was making me sick. So I then started staying in my, ca my car by myself. Um, I had a van, a minivan then. So I was staying in my minivan. Um, no, I'm sorry. My minivan had gotten, I'm sorry. Let me back up. My minivan was in a stage wreck. So I lost that car and ended up getting the car that I got shot in. So the car that I got shot in is the car that I was sleeping in. Like my minivan, though, I was sleeping in that as well. So I got up that particular morning from work. He had started staying in the car with me because he said he didn't want to stay where he was. It was just too much problems. So he asked if he could stay in the car with me. So we started staying in my car together. And um, the particular moment when I picked him up, he said, well, I know where there is two vacant apartments. You might consider getting an apartment with me. Hey, we can do that. He said, well, I can take you and show you exactly where this apartment complex is. And I said, OK, which was not too far from where we were anyway. So it was no big deal. So I pulled over to the complex and. I couldn't really see because it's three, three, maybe three fifteen in the morning. So I really couldn't see how the apartment looked, and I really didn't see anything that said for rent. So I told him, I said, "We'll just come back tomorrow when we can see a little better." On the way exiting out of the complex, I see this car that I'm telling you had been following me for um, about a week and a half. I'm going to turn some light on, okay, because it's getting dark okay. here. Right, I've not gone anywhere. I'm just going to get a drink. I'm only 30 seconds. So I'm listening to what you're saying. Okay, so um, anyway, coming out of the complex, I see this car. It's coming towards me. And I told the guy that was with me, I told him, I said, that is the car that has been following me. I said, and you know what? I need to get his tags. I told the guy, I said, I bet he's not going to stay in this complex very long. And so I told him, the guy that was with me, I told him, I said, I'm going to go sit outside of the complex. And when he comes out, then I'm going to uh, get his license tags. And so very shortly after I said that, the guy did come out. And <clears throat> I said, well, I'm not going to get right behind him. I will wait until he crosses over the lane. So I did that. So the guy went up to the traffic light and stopped, and then he turned. Well, then I said, I'm going to go ahead and try to get behind to get the tags. So I went up to the traffic light, and I turned. And so it was so dark, I couldn't see. So 
Now the guy is speeding. Um, and so I picked up just a little bit of speed, but not enough to do a full on chase. Anyway, this guy goes into this um, area where I'm very familiar with because I used to, as a young child, used to visit that area uh, of the neighborhood. So when he turned up this short street, I told the guy that was with me, I said, grab that pen and I want you to write down his license tags. So he grabs the pen and he tells me that the pen didn't write. Well, I knew that was a lie because I kept that pen in the car and it had been writing for me. So I don't know why it didn't write for him. But anyway, the car was approaching, the car that was in front of me was approaching the stop sign. So I'm not right up on the car, but I can see the car enough to see the last four digits of the, the tags. So I got the last four digits in my brain. So I remembered that, all right? What this person did when he got to the, the stop sign, he turned. When he turned, he went up the road just slightly and stopped. So, so when I approached the stop sign, I stopped, I turned and started to drive behind the car, okay? Now, as soon as I got behind this car, the person floored down on the gas and was out of sight, gone. As soon as he did that, I started seeing all of these flashes of light. I did not know at the time, Roy, I was getting shot at. I thought that maybe these were fireworks and, and that's all I could think in my mind was that somebody is shooting fireworks. Well, when I got shot one time in my leg, I felt like, wait a minute, this is, this is not any fireworks. I have something just happened to me. I didn't know exactly what still. So what I did was I took my left leg and I bought it up and I put it on the chair, the seat mm -hmm. inside of my car. This is the leg I got shot in. Mm -hmm. So you can see this is the side of the heart, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you put it together, Roy. Right here is where I got shot. Okay. Now, why not put this leg up on the seat in my car? Those bullets would have penetrated my heart. Oh, okay. Now I put the left leg up first and then I put the right leg up. Mm. So the, the bullets went from one leg to the next, ended up having 15 holes between the two legs with five bullets, which are still enlarged in my leg. Supposedly, and I say supposedly because Baptist told me that they were going to take them out, but we went back and forth on many occasions about these bullets. So and did he get caught? They said. Did the person get caught? So now I'm going to bring you way up to speed. Okay. Because right. I went into the hospital. Uh, and at that time is when I was implanted. Okay. I was left in my room for a long extended period of time, bleeding out. They would not come see about me. I stayed on that uh, emergency room bed for hours and the next thing I know they come in and tell me that we're going to have to take you to the emergency uh, to remove these whatever because your leg is swelling up so bad that your circulation is being cut off so my leg did swell a lot so they rushed me on into the emergency I have no idea but I don't think they took the bullets out I think again at that point in time is when I was implanted with this wire okay so let me, to answer your question, the day New Year's, you know, I told you I was on my way to my aunt to eat dinner and I discovered this yeah. officer. Okay. Well, then I go in, in the parking lot and I'm telling him about the incident about the feet prints. And so he was wanting to know my name and everything. And I was talking to him about all of the incidents that were occurring around my house and things that were going on with me and so on and so forth. And I told him, I said, I just recently got shot. I said, and I don't know if the perpetrator or perpetrators have been picked up or not. 
And he got my name and he said, oh, I remember that incident. I said, oh, you do? He says, yes. I said, well, you know, I haven't heard anything from the investigator. I said, so I don't know if the perpetrators are still walking around, driving around or what have you. He said, well, hold on for a minute. So he looked into his computer. I'm sitting in my car. He's sitting in his car and I can see he's typing all of this information up. And he says to me after a few minutes, the person is in prison. I said, huh? He said, the person that supposedly shot you is in prison. And I said, what do you mean supposedly? He said, because we're not sure if that's who shot you. I said, are you serious? You're telling me that this person is in prison with a long record, but now you're telling me in the same voice that you're not sure if that's who shot me? I said, that does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. So to answer your question, Roy, I don't know. I don't know if he's locked up. Why did the he, Burns Hospital not admit you? Why did they throw you out? They threw me out because they said I was videotaping nurses. <clears throat> oh, okay. It wasn't anything to do with insurance or anything. It had nothing so, to do with my Because insurance. you were videotaping. They said I was videotaping nurses. You know what was happening? I was being interviewed and it was being put on uh, YouTube about uh, the incident uh, of my shooting, okay? I was being interviewed, so I was using my phone for the interview of my shooting. And uh, if you go look, you will see my interview. You'll see me in the hospital um, after I got shot. I'm in the hospital in my bed doing an interview about my shooting. And they declared that I was... Every time they came in my room, I was videotaping nurses. Now, this is what Dr. Black, I didn't know about that. Dr. Black and uh, Karen Stewart were my advocates the whole time that I was in the hospital, both of them. And um, when Millicent found out that I was being put out of the hospital, she called the head administrator. And they told her that I was in that room videotaping nurses and that it was a a law or a rule against Baptist Hospital that you can't videotape nurses. Are you serious? I'm up there fighting for my life, but all I got to do is videotape nurses. Mm. <laughs> so they no, told her somebody oh, put uh -huh. me out. They said they put me out because I was videotaping nurses. They put me out of the hospital on the curb for six hours because I mm. videotaped nurses. Can mm. you believe it? Um, so the when you were with your first boyfriend and you heard that that ha, had that shot, <clears throat> did it continue after that? Oh, absolutely. That was the that was the start of bad things to come. So it started with my head, and it started traveling slowly but down the lower extremities of my body. Right? Why and you? Why you? Good question, Roy. Yeah. Good question. Why me? Yeah. I have my I have my suspicious reasons. Right. Um I was very active here in the city of Winston. I did a lot of outreach. You know, that's why I am an advocate now and um an international activist as well, okay? So because of these crimes. But before all of this was going on, I was very active here in the city. Um, I was program chair for the mayor pro tem of the city. So I would put programs on for different events like gang prevention and awareness. And I was uh, actually given a proclamation for that. Um, I did a lot of community outreach. And so that is the way a lot of people in the city got to know me. Um, I would do candidate bre candidates breakfast for those who were running office for correct for congressional positions, I would do things like that. And so um, when things started getting bad, when it came to my property, 
Um, there was some work done here at the house by community and development. They did shoddy work. I started complaining to the community and development. Um, when my grandmother was in the hospital, I mean, in uh, not the hospital, I'm sorry, at the nursing home, somebody beat her eye out of her eye socket and it was laying on her face. I'm so so I'm com complaining to social services and everybody that I knew about that incident. My father went into a uh, assistant living. He was supposed to be on oxygen 24 seven. Every time I would go visit him, oxygen tank empty, or it would be halfway empty. And you cannot treat a patient who's supposed to be on oxygen 24 seven with a empty tank of oxygen. There I go complaining again. It was one complaint after another, after another. And see, the thing about it is when you start bringing too much attention to these official leaders here in the city, those city councilmen and women, and all you're doing is seemingly complaining, they don't like that. Mm -hmm. Like that. And I know it. But I would call them out because you're doing things that is not right. Mm -hmm. And I believe because I had many, many complaints, as well as my own self, my property, and my family, that the official leaders here did not like it because I was making legitimate complaints, complaints about things that were, that were being done wrong, yeah. you know? And um, I believe it was a form of retaliation. That's what I believe. This was so a form did of the car, Did you ever report the car? And did the car ever get found that, that, that was, was shooting at you? Well, so the two times that I talked to the investigator, um, I um, wanted to find out from Karen Stewart because, again, they were my advocates. I couldn't get anything done because I'm trying to, to live, you know, right. when I was in the hospital. So um, Karen, on behalf of me, she called the police department and she found out who the investigator was. Well, the investigator never contacted me during the time that I was in the hospital, not one time. So when she and I found out who the investigator was, she and I both called the captain or the assistant captain uh, of the police department. And I said, you know, does it typically take this long for an investigator to reach out to you after you've been shot? Mm -hmm. And he said, do you mean to tell me nobody has contacted you? And I said, no. And so he said, well, let me get in touch with the supervisor of the investigator and I will have him to contact you. Well, the supervisor contacted me and not the investigator. And he was saying to me, like, what is it that you want? Just this nonchalant and unconcerned. And I told him, I said, I am a victim of a shooting. I have five bullets in me and I need to know who's investigating my claim. And so he was like, well, I will see if I can get in touch with the investigator. So finally, after some time had passed, the investigator finally called me. Now, he and I have only had two conversations from 2021 to 2022, because I haven't heard any more about my case. Um, and when I talked to him the last time, I was saying, well, were, you know, were you going to contact me? Were you going to let me know anything about the case? What's going on? And he was like, well, uh, the car that uh, we have is being investigated. And he said the investigator from another county is looking at this particular car, this particular person that was driving the car. And I said, well, it would have been nice for you to tell me that, you know. Um, he said, well, you know, I, I can't really tell you any more than that. And I said, well, you know, this is a case I haven't, I don't know what's happening. So what am I to think? Is the person still out here? Are they still roaming about? What should I do with this information? 
And he was like, again, I can't tell you so much. So um, I said, well, okay, uh, whatever you find out, please let me know. Hmm. Haven't heard anything from that investigator. How are you now, Lauren? How are you now? I'm sorry? How are you now? So my left leg is shorter than my right leg. I walk with the limp. I'm in constant pain, uh, especially with this wire that's been implanted in my leg. So the wire goes from my feet, up my leg, up my thigh, up my tailbone, up my spine, up my neck. And I have a bald spot where I'm being burned wow. all day. Okay. So will you get any criminal compensation from the government? No. No. Why not? Oh. You tell me? oh, no, I just thought there was a compensation scheme in America that... As did me and, and Dr. Black. And so we looked into that and there is no compensation. Okay. Of... Yeah. No money, no, no recognition. Uh, I will say if it wasn't for Anna Marie and Karen Stewart calling... WXII News 12 about my shooting and another uh, newscast, then I just would have been another alias because, and I say that because on my wristband in the hospital, they had my name spelled V as in Victor, U-R-C-H, Birch. My last name is spelled V as in Boy, U-R-C-H, Birch. They had me in the hospital with the wrong spelling of my name. And they had that with all the information in the computer, all records with the misspelling of my name. If I had died, Roy, anybody could have called that hospital and they would have said to them, we do not have a Lauren Birch. Yeah. that would have been the end of the story for me. But because people knew that my name was not Birch and Birch, then they started calling the hospital and the hospital would not let them talk to me. I started to get visitors. They put the visitors out of the hospital. put them out, told them I could not have any visitors. So your, your previous boyfriend, he wasn't on the program because you said he didn't get affected. He didn't get no, hit. He was not on the program, but Roy, it was just like I told you earlier, it was so many things happening in and around his house. Right. Uh, from bright lights being put up on street poles. Um the UPS and 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 the the postal service and Amazon. I seen trucks come down and he lived on a very short street. I seen trucks coming and going daily. Was daily. he a target? No, he was not. And he was what not about the other gentleman friend, the one that you said no? What about the one that you said might be a pup that you were in the car with? Um, no, he was not targeted, no. Oh, I right. Think he, I think he, because somebody asked me when I was in hospital doing an interview if I thought maybe he had anything to do with it. At first, I did not think that he did. But after the way he treated me when he rolled me up the hill and left me on the curb in the wheelchair, the aggression that was coming out of him, yes, mm. I believe he was involved. Yes. I do believe that now. Yes. Right. But there was so many things like street theater at my ex-boyfriend's yeah. house where I initially got hit in my head. There was a unbelievable amount of things that were occurring at, yeah. at and around his residence. And so I just didn't understand what it was all about. But then I come yeah. to realize they're stalking me. They're doing gang, uh, you know, gang theater and all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, after a while, I just started laughing because I thought 
y'all think I must be a fool to think that I can't see what you're doing around this house. You know, they were delivering with these uh, UPS trucks and, and Amazon and all of this special equipment to a target me with. That's what they so, were beginning to do. So, Lauren, have you had any medical diagnosis, schizophrenia or bipolar or any of that? Well, of course, they said that I was, I had a temporary episode of delusion. Right. Um, I don't remember them ever saying schizophrenia, but I have right, read. Okay. And, Just delusions, and, okay. Uh, yeah. And did they put you on medication, Lauren? No, sir, I am not. Oh, on any fabulous. Medication. So you've and, never been on medication and you've been sectioned twice. Yes. And let me tell you about the first incident when I went into the, the mental hospital. Um, there was a doctor that threatened me because I would not take the cyclotropic medication that they wanted me to take. See, I knew my rights as a patient. Yeah. They cannot make you take those drugs unless you are a threat to yourself or you are a threat to others. Then and only then can they make you take that medicine. Let me tell you what this doctor did when he discovered that I was not taking the, the cyclotrophic medicine he would come into my room after I think the second day and started threatening me and telling me if you do not take this medicine I'm going to have them tie you down and I'm going to shoot you up with it for 10 days this doctor told me that that wasn't the first time I heard that. You remember I told you when I got hit, my my sister and my best friend then called the emergency services. They came out and told me that I needed to go to the hospital. And I said, no. I said, I will be okay. If I'm not feeling okay the next day, I will take myself to the hospital. So I'm still on the phone with my sister and um, one of the EMS workers go out of my ex-boyfriend's house, comes back in after a short period of time and tells me I better hang up the phone now. Or perhaps I didn't go into that, but I'm going to go into it with you now. So when she looked at me and told me that I needed to hang my phone up, I said, I'm not going to hang up my phone. I said, because I'm talking to my sister. She said, you're going to hang up the phone because you're going to the hospital. I said, no, I'm not. She said, I suggest you hang up the phone right now. She said, I just got off the phone with my supervisor and she has instructed me that you need to go get evaluated at the hospital. I said, evaluated for what? And so again, she was very demanding that I get off of the, off the phone because if I had not, she was going to take it from me. And then she, once I hung up, she said, well, you know, if you don't go to the hospital, I'm going to shoot you up with this needle. This is the third time. First time I went into the mental hospital with that threat. Yeah. The second time while in the hospital, I was put into, uh, the uh, no, the first time I was taken to the mental ward, I was put in the hospital the second time while in the hospital in physical therapy, I went from there back to the hospital where they admitted me back into mental into the mental ward. Okay. And so they kept threatening me, telling me, if you don't do this, that, or the other, which was the third time I was threatened, okay, by the doctor daily. You know, they try to scare you. They use these scare tactics, you mm -hmm. know. And if you don't know any better, again, about taking these medicines, they can't make you take them. Oh, shit. Yet. It's going dead. Um... Right. I'll pause it for a second. Um, I just want to say thanks ever so much to the lovely Lauren. And uh, sadly, Lauren's phone died. Um, but perhaps we can catch up with her another day. And um, what a lovely lady and very sad uh, to be shot, to be a TI and to go through all that. 
but sadly we know most of us know how how it is being a targeted individual and my thoughts are with you lauren and all my other targeted individual friends and family and uh and that was lauren from winston salem uh north carolina um thanks very much for watching watching and uh god bless targeted individuals and uh thanks very much hang on a minute I'm not going to stop you. I'm going to pause it because she's come back. Yeah, but... um. And here we go. We've got Lauren back again. <laughs> Over to you, Lauren. Wow. Yeah, thank you so much for staying, standing by. My phone is... It, it It's doing its own thing. But yeah, the charge did go out on it. The battery went dead. Um, But I, I just want to say that I, um, I am being targeted... Um, I think differently from a whole lot of people that are being targeted because of the way my implant is in my body, um, making it easy, accessible to 5G and um, the satellite, because I'm sitting here right now on my bed and my bed and I both are vibrating. So, um, you know, that's whenever I walk uh, in state, out of state, in my car, in the hospital, in the library, doesn't matter. My target is very aggressive. And so what is happening is I believe they're burning my nervous system up from the inside. Of course, you know, I used to um, videotape every time they would strike me, they would hit my nerves and hit my veins and my veins would stand up on my skin. And I began thinking, okay, what proof would I have? So I started taking pictures and I had a lot of pictures. The phone that I had was an Apple phone. And one day it just got locked up. It locked itself up. So I figured they didn't want that evidence to be shown. So when that happened um, and the shooting happened, I guess they figured we better target her in a different way. And so uh, I figured they said, well, we better do it in a way that she's not gonna be able to take pictures because I had a lot of pictures where they would whip my body up to no end. And I mean, you know, when they take the hand and hit your vein to try to get your vein to jump up, to get a needle in you, that's how my veins used to stand up. And every time they would strike me with these frequencies, I would take a screenshot and save it. So um, I'm being targeted in a total different way from everybody else that I know. Um, and I'm not taking anything away from anybody because a target is a target is a target, okay? Uh, these crimes should not be happening. But um, I have yet to hear anybody say that they've ever been shot. And I've yet heard, yet to hear anybody say that they... Um, or being hit with microwaves 24 hours, seven days a week. And I am, I am. So my circulatory system is, um, I'm sure it's messed up. I'm sure I have some damage to my brain because I told you they hit me in my head. I've got a big old round ball spot right here. And it's something about the right quadrant of your, your head that they like to hit you on. But right here is where my ball spot is. And um, I'm constantly being hit in that area as well. They love to hit you in your feet. Um, I'm going to show you. This area or your feet is where your pulses are. So when they're hitting you in that particular area, it's to cause you to have a blood clot. A blood clot would only lead to a stroke and a heart attack. That's what a blood clot does. So um, I am very solid now in those two, the two areas on my feet, the pulse areas. Um, but um, their intention, like you already know, is to have me um, murdered, which is what they're doing daily. Every time they hit my body with these frequencies, it's attempted murder. 
This to me is considered assault and battery. And just to let you know, um, when it comes to that type of charge, there is no expiration date on that. Um, so when somebody assaults you, it's it's ongoing until you fail. Well, guilty. let's hope we get the program finished before all, all of that. Lauren, yeah. let's hope we targeted justices, um, court case and Ikator and everything else. Let's hope. We can put an end to this collectively. Well, I um I just helped another person do a letter to Jim Jordan, and um I can send it to you if you'd like to to read it. But I'm in yes, please, I'm, Lauren. I, yeah, I I told uh, Anna last night too. I was going to send her a copy. So when I send you a copy, I'll send her one too. But I'm telling everybody to take that generic letter, and send it in to Jim Jordan, and um. You know, we, we need to be proactive with these crimes because they're not going to stop until we, until we, targeted individuals, Havana Syndrome victims, get mad enough to say enough is enough. You know, if we sit well, back... Well, I think we are mad enough, but we just need to, to, to get together and have a community that all works together. Exactly. You know? I mean, exactly yeah. my point. Yeah, we yeah. need to be working together. And, yeah. you know, Roy, there's a lot of people that are afraid to speak out. But I say, if you don't, shame on you. You know, they're just going to target you until you die. And nobody mm -hmm. will ever know your name, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think people need to do interviews like this. I think they need to continue writing letters, regardless to whatever threats they tell you. If you send a yeah. letter in, send the authorities to your house. You know, you have a right to speech. You have a right to freedom. You have yeah. a right to live as a citizen in this United yeah. States or whatever country you're from, you know? And so just stop listening to what people tell you. You have a right to live, period. Yeah. And so we need to come out of being afraid about a lot of things. And I get it, but I don't get it when it comes to torture, okay? Yeah. I don't get it. I don't get it. So um, there is a lot of lawsuits that are flying right now. And uh, of course, you know, Targeted Justice just uh, filed their paperwork. And so um, they're limited as to what they want to say about these crimes. And that's OK, because basically what we need to do is get it heard in court and win the case. Yeah. And once that happens, then I think we can start uh making other charges about the drones and the gang stalking and the breaking and entering and seizing a property and stealing your money from your bank account and doing everything that they do the perpetrators mm -hmm. i'm speaking of so yes we need to stick together on this and we need to um be aggressive because they are bless yeah. your heart lauren that's that no, thanks ever so much. And I'm so sorry that you've had to go through so much. And hopefully we'll, 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 we'll all band together and um, get these wicked crimes, crimes stopped. And it's people like yourself that have come forward to do a testimony, which is going to help everybody else as well. So I'm very grateful to you, Lauren. No, thank you, Roy. It, it's... It's people like you that make it possible for people like me. Trust me. Well, and we're all together, aren't we, Lauren? We're all trying to do our bit, aren't we, to be fair? Right. And we're God's people, and he is he's not pleased at the way man is, is treating his people. And so I just know that he is not, he said he would not leave us nor forsake us, and that is what I'm, I live on that. I yeah. live on that. And even if you're not a Christian and you don't believe in uh, God, you have a higher power. Believe in something better than yourself, a little bit stronger, and believe that you are going to come out of these crimes because they cannot continue. Mm. We, we are in a free world and we cannot continue to live like we're enslaved and yeah. being treated like guinea pigs and, um, you know, being tested on. We can't live like this anymore. This is not what God has intended for our life. So thank you, Lord. 
final words over to you, Lauren. Well, um, you know, I don't know what else to say that hasn't been said, Roy, but, um, you know, we just have to remain vigilant and, um, and pray because yeah. that is the key to all things. We can't fight this giant by ourselves. We can't do mm, it. Exactly. They have uh, too much power and, and, yeah. and long money. Okay. That's the other thing. Um, yeah. but I think if we, you know, hold each other up when we're down the most and pray for one another and stay in contact, check on people that you know, and even people you don't know, if you've heard yeah. their voice, you feel like maybe they're in distress somehow, reach out to them, you know, let them know I'm there for you. I'm mm -hmm. there for no matter what you might need for me to write a letter because you don't have a computer, which I don't. So a lot of people outsource things for me, but, and I'm so grateful. Eva, uh, Karen Stewart, Dr. Millicent Black, um, Tranquility, Goji, and last but not least, Anna Toledo. I'm saying her name right. I thank you all so much. I thank you from the bottom of my heart because honestly, Roy, when I was in the hospital, if I had not had Dr. Uh, Black and Karen Stewart advocating for me, I wouldn't be here. It's so many things that you still don't know about what has happened to me at the hospital. I believe <laughs> I believe I actually was jumped on because I ended up having some bruising under my skin, which was found under an x-ray. And I mean, I could not even walk because I was in so much pain. But things like that, you know, they would follow up with the... Um, the hospital administrator and doctors, if it hadn't been for those two, I wouldn't be here. And I know it's nobody but God that didn't instructed them to follow me until I came out of that hospital. Mm -hmm. And they haven't left me yet. So this is what we need each other for. Thanks ever so much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks so, ever yeah. so much. It's so lovely to see you again, Lauren. Yeah, it's good to be seen, Roy. Yeah, and thanks very much for coming along. And uh, I'll put this up and I'll send you the YouTube and BitChute link as soon as possible. And I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. Anytime. Anytime. All right. And keep Next that time. lovely smile as well. I'm sorry. Keep that lovely smile beaming as well. I told you you need to get your glasses checked, but thank you so I, much. I've me. had them. These are new ones. <laughs> oh, gosh. You need to get your prescription changed then. I, perhaps I do. <laughs> no, you stop it. you got a lovely smile. I'm very grateful to you, Lauren. I'm very grateful to you. You have no idea. Yeah. Bless your you heart. So much. Yes, you're doing so much for this community. And thank you for your platform because, again, nobody would know about little old Lauren if it hadn't been for Roy. Okay, well, let, let, let's get Lauren's name out and her story out. And because Lauren's um, a big advocate for targeted individuals. Yes, I am. And um, Lauren's on the, uh, the side that helps people, aren't you, yes. Lauren? Yes, I am. Yeah. I can't send, stand to see anybody in pain, including myself. And again, yeah. this is what God intended for his people to be in suffering. Yeah. So anything I can do to help anybody, I've opened up my home to a couple of people who, uh, Cliff, you would know. Um, I won't really go into that, but they have done me wrong. Uh, but it's okay. What I right. do, I do for yeah. my heart. And I'll do it again if I feel like somebody needs some place to stay. Um, I have not a small house. It's not a grand house, but it's mine. Um, yeah. I'll open wow. my door to anybody in need. So. What a lovely yeah. gesture. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Bless you, Lauren. Thanks ever so much. Take You're care, welcome. darling, and hopefully see you soon. Okay, let me ask you one question. When is the next Zoom meeting? Sunday. Sunday's at 7.30 GMT. 
so, so it's two thirty in the afternoon your time. Uh, no, what? you're six hours behind. So it's one thirty, but we go on for five or six hours anyway. Well, you'll send me a, a notice, right, to let me know. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll send you a link. God bless you, Roy. Yeah. God bless, God bless you, Lauren. Likewise, lovely to see you, and thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thanks, Take darling. Care. Take care, Lauren. Bye. All right. Bye.